thank you very much, Kurt de Boeuf, for this really impressive um, lecture. And it came to my mind, if we need just one proof for what historians are good, here we have it. Because it's really enlightening to compare something that has happened so many decades, centuries ago with what's ongoing right now. And for people like you and others who work with the Middle East, I think it's also good to hear some good news from time to time, because so many news are always desperate. So I would like to open the floor to engage in a discussion if you share this positive impression that not everything is over, but things are going on, or if you have different attitudes. And I think we have more than half an hour time to discuss, so it should be uh, time to, to everyone who wants to engage in this debate to give a sign, and I keep a small list. So who is the icebreaker? Ah, there's a microphone in the room. In terms of uh, comparing your framework between different rev uh, revolutions, where would you put the uh, Iranian revolution in terms of the rise of the Islamic Brotherhood? And that there was that, uh, in my opinion, how I would see it directly, that they've only gone through two stages. Is that over? What is your perception on that? And how would you see the development of that going on, even after such a long reign of the um, Islamic regime? It's a very interesting question. Unfortunately, I didn't think that one through yet. So um, it would be too quick to answer that immediately. Um, it's going, let's say that their uh, reign of terror is going, <laughs> it's going on for a pretty long time. Um, but I think that, that, that even though Iran is, 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 seems to be something different, I really think, I mean, I'm sure that the, the Arab revolution has had an enormous impact on the younger generations uh, in Iran, and still do. So, um, of course, they had this moment in 2009 with the Green uh, Movement, which eventually failed, but um, it came back not a very long time ago. And um, one interesting thing, I mean, I was in Iran two years ago, and I believe at that moment, the Minister of Religious Affairs complained that nobody was attending the mosque on Friday. So he said that only 3% of the population goes to the mosque on Friday, which is for an Islamic country, not much. So it means that, that, that I'm not talking about being religious or not, but that if you get religion and state together, I mean, then people start to, to, to hate both sometimes at the same time. And, and other statistics I have seen is that the amount of atheism, for example, in Iran is very high. So there is some, sign of, some kind of silent debate going on, and a lot is going on underground. By the way, I mean, I'm sure for those who know Iran is that I heard, I, I didn't see it unfortunately myself, but that the underground parties in Iran are probably the best of the world. So people are actually, the, the regime is a kind of surface thing with people, one not believing in it and actually also not acting to it. So the question is, in that respect, how much did the Islamic revolution succeed in the end? Probably not at all, but the repression is still there and I, I really can't say when that is going to fall. But having said that, um, an interesting comparison with that is that what we have seen in Egypt um, is that after the fall of Morsi, suddenly people saw that the books that they have been reading all their lives, what they grew up with, which was living along the lines of Sunni Islam, suddenly they saw that the foreword was written by Hassan al-Banna, who was the, 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 the one who founded, uh, the founder of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And because they hated Morsi and the whole system, they, feel, they felt betrayed, that they, they as revolutionaries a bit were betrayed by the Muslim Brotherhood, suddenly they started to combine what they have been learning all their lives and what they have been seeing in reality. And a lot of people changed their ideas about religion during that time. I mean, it's hard, I cannot generalize, but I know people who were, well, very, very close to the Muslim brother. I mean, for example, one lady, she was married to the nephew of Hassan al-Banna, so she was very close to the Muslim Brotherhood. 
But during the Morsi time, and certainly at the end, I mean, she's, she took off her, her veil and, and she just started tweeting about religion and so forth. So an, a massive change. So, and another thing which was also interesting is that during Morsi time, I mean, although there was a lot of freedom, I mean, certainly officially, you could feel social pressure. So when you took the metro in Cairo, I mean, everybody was praying all the time. They were reading the Quran all the time. I have nothing against reading the Quran, but I mean, it was very obvious that everybody was reading the Quran. The end of mercy, then suddenly you, you didn't see, well, when few people were reading the Quran, but people were just playing games again on their telephone. They were just like back to normal life. So it's a lot to analyze, analyze about, but, but this, this connection between religion and state is a very interesting one. So, um, and I'm pretty sure that, 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 that when, for example, Khamenei will die, it can be, well, in the years to come, I mean, if the next, I mean, Khamenei already had a lot less authority than Khomenei, so if Khamenei dies, who will have enough authority to get this regime on his shoulders and continue what is going on. I think many people have doubts about that. Hi, I, I'm Andrea Teti. I'm an associate professor of um, international relations at the University of Aberdeen and visiting professor at um, University of Ghent, Middle East and North Africa Research Group. Um, I've got one piece of good news and one piece of bad news. Um, I, we, um, and Jan was also involved in this, but I'm, I was the director of the Arab Transformations Project, which was a survey kind of uh, based project. And the piece of, let's say, bad news is that in terms of the f parts of the population that supported the demographics that supported the uprisings, it's not just young people. Um, so in fact, if you look country by country, there's actually no significant difference in terms of people who supported and actually participated in um, the uprisings. Uh, so the situation is actually worse from that point of view than, uh, but I think we agree on that. Um, in relation to religion is the good news because some of the data that, that we've been looking at is, is fascinating because it tells, if you ask questions about whether people identify religiously, whether they want to see more kind of religion in public life, uh, the answer, broadly speaking, is yes. But if you then ask people, well, do they trust religious leaders? Do they want them to you know, have an influence on government decisions or uh, an influence on people's votes? The answer is emphatically no. So that separation between uh, uh, you know, religiosity and support for, for uh, religious organizations is actually fairly clear. And you can see this really well, actually, in the Egyptian case, in the, the case of the, uh, the, the, the January uprising or revolution or whatever you want to call it, because between January 24th and January 27th, the Akwan, the Salafi, the Coptic Church as well, the Azhar, all recommended that people stay at home. So they were, they were as surprised as the next person that, that all these people turned out nationwide. So I think I, I really like the fact that you're underlining the, the, this, this potential difference or distance between individual feelings, uh, individual religiosity even, and kind of, let's say, organized religion. Uh, and I think it's quite right that the, the, the connection between organized religion and the state, more or less strong as it is in the case of individual actors, is undermining the legitimacy of those organizations. I think it's not only un, it wasn't only undermining religion, it was undermining authority in general. And, uh, well, Jan was a professor in the Cairo University. A professor of Cairo University told me that students, I mean, used to be, as you say, silent followers. I mean, they just were, well, students who didn't speak up. And when the re revolution was going on, but still today, as a result of it, they, they are just not obedient anymore. So if they have a problem, if they have a reaction, they just say it. If they do not agree, they go out and so forth. So authority has crumbled thanks to the rev revolution. And the same was, I mean, some people did go to the mosque if they liked the, the, the imam. But if he was speaking against the revolution or speaking against things they believed in, they just stopped going to the mosque. So it is the entire concept of authority um, and and it's exactly the reason why, and I'm glad that my, uh, uh, my gut feelings or whatever are, are supported by uh, sound uh, research. Of course, I did read some research too, but I mean, um, is that that's also the reason 
I mean, why I believe that despite the feeling that we're just back in the times of Mubarak, back in the times of whoever, I mean, the spirit is out of the bottle. So people have felt what it is to be free, felt what it is not to, to listen, felt what it is to defy authority. authority. That's what they have felt. And I think, I mean, I, I might be wrong, but I think that it's impossible to put this feeling, this experience back in the bottle. So people, of course, n now know, like, okay, it's not the moment for a new revolution. By the way, for example, the economy is that bad, just give you an example of Egypt is that the prices since one year and a half have doubled if not tripled in Cairo who are in Egypt so I just read a story this week about a teacher uh, he's, he's a school teacher I mean uh, and he's not able to buy to pay diapers for his baby because it's too expensive so he's he's just hoping now that uh, 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 yeah well whatever no um, it's terrible I mean People can't buy the, the normal things anymore. So, and of course they blame partly the authority, but they also know that a new revolution will probably very, be very bloody. It will be them against the army. While in 2011 the army has protected them against the police, now it will be against the army. So they know what can go wrong, so they're a bit more quiet. But still inside, I believe that this revolutionary flame is, is, is very much there. We have also some people here in the room who were born in Arab countries or have some familiar relations with the Arab countries. It would be nice if you could also share your impressions. Otherwise, I would have a question. Um, you say the genie is out of the bottle and people have learned that they should not be suppressed by authorities but the regimes have also learned their lesson. I think we can see a kind of domino effect that Bashar al-Assad learned a lot from Gaddafi's end and that the regimes learned their lessons. The Egyptian regime, from the beginning, they, they cut every civil society activity because it might lead to something that could potentially be dangerous to the regime. <coughs> so is it correct to be still pessimistic and hesitant when it comes to this will certainly lead to the better future? It was certainly true that, that, that through the, um, if you look at back, no, okay, um, to the revolutions and the, un and, and the responses to it, I mean, Ben Ali was tricked by his close advisors to go to Saudi Arabia. They said, just go there for a while until everything is quiet and then you can come back. Well, he never came back. Mubarak thought, okay, they won't trick me. So actually, there was a coup against Mubarak by the SCAF, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces. He was deposed by the armed forces and by no one else. Of course, of pressure by, 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 by the street. But if the armed forces would have said, no, he's not going, then Mubarak would not have been going. So uh, uh, that was also very clear. And... The next, indeed, the next countries where we have seen a revolt or a revolution, they in, indeed learned from it. They said, okay, if, we now, if we're going to give in, then we're going to fall. So Gaddafi said, I'm not going to give in. I'm going to hunt you down, huh? zinga, zinga, street alley to alley, house to house, apartment building to apartment building. So they knew in Benghazi that when he was arriving with all his tanks, he was killed them all. It was uh, 600,000 people. So that's why I still believe in the Libya intervention, because they prevented a massive, massive massacre, uh, uh, 80 times uh, uh, Srebrenica. But indeed, he learned. So fight until the very end. But Assad on his learned again from, uh, from Gaddafi, which is, don't go to Aleppo and say, we're going to kill them all because then they're going to kill me. No, just do it bit by bit and go maximum 100 deaths a day and count it. I mean, uh, Iaz is sitting there, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a Syrian activist, but almost never in the last seven years did Assad or his forces or whatever kill more than 100 people a day. Yeah, Guta, yeah, but, but it's almost one, so nobody's going to do anything anymore. 
So it was always bits by bits. So it's always just not enough to do something, just not enough to intervene, just not enough to support a free Syrian army who were fighting for freedom and so forth and who were then completely, completely collapsed. So it was always not enough. So that was very smart. So, uh, uh, um, and even then, he was collapsing in uh, um, 2014. It was almost over. But then the Iranians who saw what was happening called the Russians, and the Russians came in and, uh, well, game almost, in fact, game over. It's not over yet, by the way. Those who think that Assad is now the solution and that he is the guy who can bring stability and that there's no other solution and so forth and so forth. I mean, the Syrians who have given so much sacrifices, who have gone through so much, I mean, they're not going to just now sit at home and say, okay, this is the only way we have to get out of it, so it's going to be Assad. So even though we all now think and see, like, okay, it's going to be this way, but people are not just going to sit at home. I mean, it's going to continue all and all over, over again. So it's not going to stop. So, so going to continue with Assad is just not the solution. Every other solution might be workable. Even for the Syrian opposition, they say, whoever comes in his place, I mean, is going to be a basis for negotiations, but not with him. I mean, uh, but the Russians uh, do not agree. So I'm afraid that the Syrian war will continue endlessly until the end of Assad, unfortunately. Yes, good evening, uh, Eva Verstala, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I think you made a very strong point saying that any conclusion is far too early now at this stage, that the revolution or the changes have not yet finished. But on the other hand, um, maybe the revolution will not take, well, that will definitely not take all that long as the French Revolution, given the social media and the, the importance of the social media in this revolution. And also, if you compare other changes, although they're not really political, but more on the economical front, in many Asian countries, how fast they all of a sudden went through revolutions that we, well, we went from the Middle Ages until now, and they went through all these stages in a couple of tens of years. So I think a revolution nowadays is a, possible a lot faster than, than the times of the French Revolution. Hmm. That's true. Um, if you look to Indonesia, for example, after uh, 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 Suharto um, and Sukarno, um, things went pretty fast because also there was uh, one leader, a vice president, let's say uh, Habibi, who was very, f who did all the reforms in one year. Then he was uh, kicked out by the public, unfortunately, but but he did a great job in in, in stabilizing democracy on a very short term, a thing that, and, for, and, 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 and he had also coup, coups against him. So the, the things were right, in the right place, for example, in Indonesia, but they were also lucky. I mean, in the Philippines, we have also seen, I think, a very nice transition, but right now, I mean, things are not going very well. So we also see the country going in the opposite direction. We have seen, Nice transitions in South America, uh, Chile as being the best example, uh, 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 or Mexico, Brazil. Um, but you also, we've also seen Argentina going in the opposite direction. So while we were thinking that once you have revolution and democracy, it, there's only one way, I think in the last 20 years we've all learned that there's two ways and that uh, uh, the opposite way can also be uh, very dangerous. Having said that, I mean, there's one thing I didn't talk about, and, and um, it's the borders of countries. And um, I'm just not sure also that when we will look, let's say, in about 20 years from now in the Arab world, if we still will have the same borders between countries, I'm not convinced at all. I mean, these borders were put there basically by the French and the English, and the British, excuse me, in, uh, uh, in, um, but during the, the First World War and immediately after. So, but I think 
a lot might still change in that respect. I mean, the Kurdistan independence uh, 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 referendum was just one example, but a peaceful example, but I also think we will see less peaceful examples of changing borders uh, in, in, in the coming years. And uh, even Libya might be one example. So, um, Mr. Ambassador, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could think of South Sudan as a newly created country, 2011, which is kind of this kind of state collapse system, which not necessarily leads to the better. Apparently. So, in, in short, if I'm if I want to say I'm optimistic, uh, uh, I'm optimistic in the long term. In the short term, I'm rather pessimistic, because I think that, I mean, there is a worst case scenario. I mean, the worst case scenario is that if Bouteflika dies in Algeria that people do not agree with his uh, with his uh, his successor things might explode again in algeria i mean things might going still isis might come back in libya in the chaos there are signs of that isis is again hiding and coming back reorganizing in iraq they're clearly reorganizing uh, in syria around Deir ez -Zor. i mean iran is not finished yet with iraq and syria and, and, and so forth. I mean, even in Saudi Arabia, the reforms that bin Salman is doing is not because he thinks it's necessary or he thinks that it's better for uh, 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 Saudi Arabia. I mean, in there, the pressure on the monarchy is enormous. Just one example is that uh, while economically things are going a bit worse, also in Saudi Arabia, you have not less than 23,000 princelings. So members of the royal family who all, want, who all want to live like royals and just cannot pay this anymore. I mean, and I think one of the signals that Mohammed bin Salman has given by jailing all these rich people is like, guys, I think we have to slow down. And if you don't, I mean, I'll just take your money. So things are still very explosive. And don't forget what they are doing with Qatar right now. I mean, there's a blockade against Qatar by the Gulf, by Egypt, by Jordan. So there is a lot of language of war that we are seeing. So on the short term, we might have well also see an explosion happening, but uh, okay. Hello, um, I would like to go back to the comparison between the Arab Revolution and the French Revolution. And also back to uh, the lady at the front uh, saying that it might be faster because of communication on the social media. Um, I think it's open for both scenarios. It can be even longer, it de depending on uh, what I think is the question of identity. Um, what happened in, uh, in, in Egypt, for example, is right after the fall of Mubarak, people started asking, I mean, the revolutionary started asking a question of who Egyptians are. Who they wanted to put clearly the Egyptian identity on paper in, to be able to uh, to build the new constitution while having this debate which could have lasted for the next 100 years the Muslim Brotherhood as a political group which was already active on the ground and the army uh, cooperated together and they were doing a totally different thing and uh, the revolutionary were outfoxed so I think it can go shorter of course with the help of uh, communication technology if the revolutionary would understand very well what is the meaning of transitional justice and transitional democracy, to think of a temporary stability until answering the very big questions of who we are to write uh, a permanent constitution, which is always the case in every revolution. And I think the key is to understand this transition. Um, I also believe that it is not over and it will happen again. People will be back again in the street. And I also agree it will be much more bloodier in countries like Egypt or wherever. Uh, but it, it, again, it can be way longer than the French Revolution if we continue asking very existentialist identity questions. Uh, and it can be much faster if we are very ready with uh, the so-called transitional justice, transitional uh, democracy. Thank you. That was a comment, right? <laughs> Thanks for this, and we have the two gentlemen on the right hand side here. Je m'appelle Aziz Al Bichari. Je suis ex-député en Belgique, mais il le sait aussi, je suis libyen. 
Donc je suis né à Benghazi, euh, voilà. Euh, toute la révolution en Libye, j'ai commencé, j'étais là-bas, je suis revenu. Euh, et la question, ce n'est pas une question, mais c'est des, des, des questions que je vais poser. Il faut retourner en, en histoire, en Afrique du Nord, dans le pays arabe, avant la Première Guerre mondiale. Et là, on comprendrait tout ce qui se passe aujourd'hui. Par exemple, la Libye, en 1930, ça n'existait pas. Il y avait d'autres... Et la Libye a été créée par Mussolini en 1930. Donc la Libye d'aujourd'hui, il y a quelque chose derrière aussi. Euh, on peut rajouter ça pour euh, le Maroc, l'Algérie, la Tunisie, l'Égypte. Tous les pays arabes sont créés par les Européens. Qu'ils soient en France, en Angleterre, en Italie, en, enfin, en, la colonisation en fait. La politique en Europe sont en train aussi, aussi en train de changer. En Angleterre, en France, en Espagne, en Italie, en Grèce. Euh, donc les, la politique des partis en Europe sont aussi en train de se casser la gueule. Je dis ce mot exactement parce que c'est... Et ça a commencé en, à la révolution en Tunisie. Donc on est parti pour 10 ans, c'est ce qu'on a dit il y a 10 ans, ben on va y aller. Hein. Et je voudrais poser une question. Qu'est-ce que les partis européens, donc en, en Belgique, en Angleterre, en Hollande, en Allemagne, tous les partis, dans tous les partis, dans tous les partis en Europe, se rendent-ils compte de cela Je sais que chez eux, le problème en France, dont j'ai parlé là en Angleterre, par rapport à l'Europe, sont en train de se casser la gueule et ça n'a rien à voir avec l'autre côté de la Méditerranée. Parce que la Méditerranée, pour moi et pour beaucoup de gens, c'est le centre de tout. Et on le, on le, voit, on le voit encore aujourd'hui comme le sud de la Méditerranée, l'Afrique du Nord, l'Est, l'Ouest, alors que tout ça, c'est le centre de, depuis, tout, depuis toujours. Bon, euh, je crois que c'est un, un problème général. Alors, euh, la manque de connaissances, euh, euh, pas seulement de, du monde arabe, mais en, en général, je veux dire, du monde... Et enfin, un exemple, c'était, euh, j'étais à Washington et je, en 2005, j'étais avec enfin, notre ambassadeur, il me montrait le New York Times dans, la, de, dans lequel on, 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 on expliquait la différence entre les chiites et les sunnites en Irak. Et que ça, c'était un peu problématique et, tout, et je pensais, bon, alors on a... Un, on trouve maintenant, euh, après deux ans de guerre en Irak, qu'il y a les chiites et les sunnites en Irak. Alors, euh, alors c'est pas, c'est bon, c'est un peu caricature. Hein, bon, enfin, disons que les services euh, diplomatiques euh, de, 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 de la, des, des États-Unis le savaient bien, mais on, on sait bien que même les, les plus informés, comme les Américains, sont aussi ceux qui font les plus grandes erreurs. Alors, euh, avec toujours une manque de, 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 de d'informations, il manque de vision et il manque de, de, de oui, d'essayer de, de, à comprendre ce qui se passe vraiment enfin, euh, euh, dans ces pays, à mon avis. C'est peut-être aussi une arrogance de notre part qu'on pense, euh, bon, ça sera comme ça et comme ça, et, et, et on exécute des, 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 des décisions qui n'ont qui rien à voir à ce qui se passe euh, euh, sur le terrain. Mais je ne suis pas totalement d'accord avec vous qu'il faut vraiment regarder dans l'histoire bien pour comprendre, ça c'est sûr, et nous avons construit les pays euh, euh, au Moyen-Orient, mais aussi, bon, quel pays en Europe est un pays, pays naturel Alors, tous les pays sont, ont aussi été euh, construits à un certain temps. L'Autriche, enfin, tous les pays ont été construits après la Première Guerre mondiale, les autres après Waterloo et tout ça. Alors, on doit toujours quand même vivre dans un dans une espace euh, 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 imaginé, non Alors, euh, et c'est le problème de l'identité en Égypte. Bon, en fait, tous les espaces sont imaginés, mais mieux comprendre, c'est le but des de, de lectures qu'on fait maintenant. Alors, euh um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the role of the European Union in the near future on these possible escalations in on the so, on our southern front. And I think this question comes very close to the previous question. But if you look at Uh, the, the intervention in Libya where we saved lives by intervening against the Gaddafi regime. We also contributed to the escalation in Syria in some part, in some ways, 
by providing indirect support to uh, rebel groups uh, who were also radicalists and how in the future we could help stabilize some of those countries um, to avoid some of the worst parts of, of some of the worst phases of uh, the revolution framework you described earlier in your in your lecture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Shall we collect? No, no, no. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was still thinking in French. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we collect? Yeah, collect. Yeah, okay, so we collect the four and then we have a final vo veto uh, vote on. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm a gender specialist, so I have a gender-related question. You talk about strong men. I would like to know about strong women, mm -hmm. if you have, you know, came across this. Particularly, what do you think has been the impact on women and girls throughout the phases that we already, that you already presented and that we saw? And what do you think would be, what has been their role so far and what could be the role in the future? Thanks. Thank you. I also agree with the lady in the front, uh, the foreign minister. I also think that, that the changes in the revolution can, can happen a lot more faster. Even if we see at, at, at the pace in history, we see that changes tend to, to, to um, pr proceed more faster and rapidly. If you see at wars, we have wars of 100 trees. So I think we become more uh, proficient in our own stupidity in that sense. Um, the second question, I, I don't know, it can take longer if, if we look at external interests in the region. Uh, if we speak about Egypt, we have uh, the, uh, no, the channel there, a big channel that is really important for some countries for um, transportation of goods. Or if we see at Libya, uh, now we hear news report that it was a personal vendetta with uh, Sarkozy, that he helped the revolution in Libya or killed the dictator in Libya. And so we have a certain selection, which region we're going to support or which re region we're going to postpone or, I don't know, in that sort of sense. That was my question if you talked about the uh, external factors uh, influencing the region. Thanks, and the last question here in front. Uh, first of all, thank you for still letting me ask my question. Um, you mentioned something about tying in personal experience, and uh, one of the reasons I'm here is that two months after my birth, I moved to Oman with my family, and it's not really personal experience, but rather my father's experience with the locals who were more uh, intertwined with the uh, expats, so to speak, but they had a general perception of Every time they would talk about their government, they would kind of uh, go like, oh, yeah, you know, they're trash. Uh, they, don't, they don't really do much. Uh, I don't care about it. But that's the exact perception that I think is going to change, that because of, for example, your generation in, uh, in that area of the world, in the Arab states, they grew up with the dictatorship, and they're used to not really having a say. Uh, they're used to not really having an effect on the actual regime that is governing them. But with the younger generation now growing up with some more social media, more ideas being communicated, and especially more democracy or a certain sense of democracy uh, in any case, that they are going to be a lot more involved. And since they are, once they assume more influential positions, what will be the change in terms of the revolution that we have seen recently and the revolution that you think is still going to come? Uh, and in that sense, I disagree with the gentleman in the back that it's going to be more bloody since people are more involved and are going to be learn to be more involved in politics, that is going to be a bit more civilized in terms of progressive discussion. And what would be your thoughts on that? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> the role of the European Union, um, or for that matter of fact, external factors, um, I think it's... Um, I think the, 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 um, the worst thing of, let's say, the EU Arab revolution uh, timing was that the EU was in the middle of a massive crisis, a massive financial economic crisis. I mean, I remember I was then working at the European Parliament and I was day in, day out working on how will we save Greece? Uh, will Italy collapse? Will Portugal collapse? So at that very moment, the most important political earthquake in, the, in our neighborhood is, is, is happening. And I mean, we were putting our attention and all our money on our economy. And by doing this, I think the EU missed a, a huge opportunity um, for not making a sort of Marshall Plan 
that was dearly needed. A Marshall Plan, I mean, you remember after the Second World War, the United States gave money to Europe in order to rebuild uh, uh, the continent on the condition of having democracy and so forth. Without that condition, probably democracy would have been here as well. Maybe not, I don't know. But it had an impact. And I think that from what I have seen from this side of Mediterranean is that the impact of the EU was very small. What we have been doing was packaging and repackaging of things that already existed, sometimes a bit more. Um, but the American impact was equal equally almost zero so uh, um, I mean on, on, on this kind of things I really think that that this kind of Marshall plan if we would have done this really 2011 12 would have had a big impact in the region um, but okay we didn't because I think for two reasons first of all because of the, the crisis and secondly I also think, and, and I know there are some experts here uh, from the EU, from the EAS, uh, um, but that also the general knowledge within our EU structure about the Middle East, uh, just the general interest was just far too low. I mean, people had no idea what was going on. So that's also the reason why they sent me there. I also had no idea, I, I admit. So I had an idea, hopefully, a bit afterwards. But um, I think these were the two elements. And that's also the reason why I think that, for example, in Syria um, and in Libya, that we now know that doing nothing is also a political choice. That, I mean, we didn't, I mean, I, I know the Syrian file from, I mean, these years, I mean, 11, 12, 13, from very close by. I mean, I was in it, so. And it was very frustrating to see that, that at, certainly in the beginning, with enough support, I think things would have gone much faster in the good direction. But of course, I mean, I'm not going to talk about all the conversations I had, but we didn't want to get involved because it looked a bit messy. And we thought, like, yeah, maybe it, we're going to do the wrong thing. Um, Libya was different. I think, um, I think. The Libyans asked us to do much more, uh, not just on border control, but on organizing police and so forth. I mean, I went to Ashton herself with, with Libyans, I mean, and, and, and she was like, yeah, but that's not European competence. This is not, we cannot do this, we cannot do this. I'm not interested in this. We're going to send someone. I mean, there was no sense of urgency at that point, I mean, in my feeling. So... Uh, I know other people know the dossier here much better, so I stand to be corrected. But um, um, so yeah, the, the external factors in the region. Uh, then again, uh, to go back on your comment on Sarkozy, this was not a thing of Sarkozy. I mean, uh, there was not a revenge thing of Sarkozy. Um, of course, Sarkozy was ashamed that he he um, that he missed, let's say, the revolution in Tunisia. He had something against Gaddafi, that for sure. I mean, uh, 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 there was perhaps with him, within him, some revenge part. But NATO could not do anything because of Sarkozy. He had a personal problem with Gaddafi. I mean, that's not how it worked. Well, I mean... Yeah, but if we look, if, if we look to, 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 to today, modern times, last, let's say, 10 years, I think that our external influence in the region has been very low. I mean, I mean the only example you could think of is, is, is appointing Maliki as prime minister of, of Iraq, which was actually suggested by the Iranians and the Americans had no idea who it was. So Europeans had nothing, almost nothing to do with that. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if we have influenced politics. Yes? Yeah, 
Yeah, but that's intellectual. That's something very different. That's something uh, very so different. I, I would like to invite you to <laughs> deepen the discussion after the official end of the session, because otherwise we get lost, and we will probably find many examples that speak in favor and speak against each position. So it might be good to have this conversation outside. No, I, I just want to say that in general, I mean, why did lots of these leaders and kings go to American or European schools simply because they were the better schools? Sorry, I mean, uh, and yeah, 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 sorry. So, so, so I, I've, I've, I've been. I, I know, I know, school system and I'm talking about Egypt. I mean, if I would, I mean, you have some good schools, but I mean, yeah, I mean, if you want your children to have better education that's it's still today they're sending their children to, to to europe i mean it's not my fault that they're doing it so um please um on the gender issue the role of women um i think during the revolutions women have played a significant role i mean just one example is is, is i mean for uh, um i now forgot her name uh, the lady who called on facebook uh, to go to tahrir asma mahfouz I mean, she called to go to Tahrir Square. I mean, she's a good friend. She's a really frail w girl, I mean, who had this, this courage to do that. I mean, you had people like Mona El Tahawi, like Mona Saif, and so forth. So they, they played an important role, I mean, in, in, in the revolution as such. I mean, afterwards, I mean, they hardly did. I mean, in the power-making system. Why? Because they were part of this revolutionary generation and this generation just didn't play a part in everything that came afterwards. I mean, they did some pushing left and right, but if you saw presidential candidates, I mean, in the, actual, the discussions about who to do what, then it were, let's say the old, I almost said white guys, but I mean the old middle-aged guys and old guys who just took over again, who have been in politics for decades. So. Having said that, I mean, the amount of women elected in the several parliaments in Tunisia and even in Egypt, I mean, is, is pretty impressive. But the role they're playing actually in the power game is very limited. There are, so, there are some ministers who are, who are women, but let's say in the real hard power, as much now as they had, let's say, before the revolution, I'm afraid. So... One of the most powerful ministers, at least for foreigners, was uh, 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 was uh, Minister Abu Faiza. I mean, she was a terrible uh, uh, minister, I mean, at least for foreigners, but she was powerful. And now I think she's back in government. So, um, so did things change? The most disappointing thing to me, I mean, about the gender issue, was that that the women who were elected for the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis in the Egyptian parliament did nothing to defend the rights of women in Egypt. On the contrary, I mean, they were defending crazy stuff who were against emancipation of women. And that was very disappointing. And the others just were not elected. So we got at a certain point really like, I mean, is this the female representation? That's, that's very, very sad. There's one country which we have to look at right now, and that's Turkey. Um, of course, it's Erdogan. They have the other parties in Turkey. But there's a new party called EE Party, the good party, and they're doing very good in the polls. They're, they're, they're actually doing... Some polls have been extremely favorable for them. And the leader of the party is a woman, so Meral Akşener. And she's a candidate against Erdogan. And... If things are, I mean, I think her strategy might work, and it's perhaps up to us Europeans to support her uh, as much as possible. I think uh, she might need it. But just imagine that you get in a country like Turkey, I mean, uh, a female president, I think that would be a massive example uh, for the region. So I'm looking very much forward uh, to that. Um, last question about the revolutionary generation and violence and civilization or civilized. Uh, um, I don't think that the generation is going to be the problem in the violence. I mean, the violence will come from the system who will not give up their power. And generations just play a lot in less in the, in, in the army. I mean, I know... 
army soldiers and officers who left the army after revolution because they said, I just can't work for these guys anymore. That's a very small minority. I mean, most people, I mean, going to work in the army is the best job you can get because you get respect, you get well paid, and you have a, a future, you can climb up in the hierarchy. And if you become a general, I mean, you're okay for the rest of your life because if you got uh, your pension, you get a factory somewhere where you still can earn a nice amount of money. So these generations, they're already now in the economy and sometimes in positions. And do they have an influence on society? I truly believe so. That's why I'm thinking that this genie, they are carrying this genie that is out of the bottle. Will they be able to make a real difference, let's say, within 10 years when the revolution comes back? I have no idea. I mean, the generation of 68 in Europe who was very leftish, I, right now the most sometimes far-right people you can imagine in Europe, so you don't know how people are going to change. So, uh, but um, I hope that more or less uh, answers your question. It's a big question mark for me as well. So um, we can only hope that they keep some ideals and that they keep pushing the Middle East and North Africa towards democracy, be it quick, be it less quick, uh, we will see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Kurt de Boeuf. Uh, I found this was an extremely intellectually stimulating evening and at the same time also kind of emotional, reinsuring and comforting evening with this positive tone in your analysis. It's impressive to see how much you know and how you bring the things together and I was also impressed by your readiness to discuss even sensitive issues in a very frank and open way. And even if not everyone maybe agrees with everything, I think it, it provoked many good thoughts for us. And uh, for this, really a big thank you from my side. It's my pleasure to just hint uh, your attention to the next lecture in this series, which will take place on 17th of April, 6 o'clock here. Uh, Tarek Osman will speak on the future of Islam and Tarek Osman is the author of various books that deal with the topic and is also an advisor of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So if you have the time then uh, a warm welcome and uh, if you celebrate Easter have a blessed and happy Easter and hopefully see you then in the next lecture. Have a good evening and a safe way back home. Thank you very much. Thank you.